What's up everybody? John the Morgyle here, checking in for a quick video for you. Hope y'all are doing very well. Um, forgive me, I'm a bit low tech still right now. My computer is on the lam. It physically got dropped and it's it's uh won't even boot up. So uh, I can't do much editing or anything like that. But I did want to put out a, uh, I guess you could say an expansion of the last quick video I made talking about the uh, the so-called final experiment. And I guess I'd probably want to expand on that a little bit so it's clear, you know, where my thoughts are at on this topic. Um, first and foremost, y'all know where I stand on the shape of the world. That's been made clear over the last 10 years. But really, where, where I think the question lies is in the celestial luminaries, the heavens, the mysteries of the most high, right? Um, I, I think the best way to explain where I stand on this is to bring this all the way back to a, an excerpt from Carl Sagan's Cosmos, which is a strange place for a flurfer to take the conversation for sure. But as most of y'all know, I was reared on planet Earth and was very much a NASA fanboy and a, a fan of the cosmos and Carl Sagan in general for the majority of my life, even still, for the majority of the time that I've been here. And so in Carl Sagan's cosmos, the point that I wanted to talk about was an analogy that Carl Sagan put in that book about flatland. And that's, I guess, apropos but basically what he was trying to do was to explain how higher dimensions are beyond the capacity of lower dimensional beings to interpret properly. So with you and I living in the third dimension, you know, 3D, um, if we encounter something of a higher dimension, it will present itself quite mysteriously to us, right? So the analogy in Flatland brings it down a dimension to the second dimension, right? So when we're talking about dimensions, uh, one dimension would be like a dot in, in, not even in space, just like a dot on a sheet of paper. That dot would be representing of one dimension. It doesn't have width or breadth or height. It just is a dot. It's kind of hard to fathom. Um, two dimensions on a sheet of paper would be like a line or a square or a triangle, right? And, uh, well, there I'm flying it down. Sorry. I'm holding my phone in front of me, so forgive me. Um, and then the third dimension would have, you know, height and width. It would be like a cube would be like three dimensions, right? And so if you can kind of put yourself in the shoes of a second dimension observer somehow, so like if, you're, if your whole existence is stuck within a sheet of paper and you're only ever dealing with the second dimension, um, if you somehow walked up to a square in the second dimension and you yourself are a second dimension observer, um, you wouldn't recognize that it's a square. You would only see like one side cross section of it. You'd see a line in front of you, right? And if you walk around it, you might could um, sort of gauge that it's a square once you take measurements and angles of the sides. But it wouldn't be apparent to you as a second dimensional observer, um, whether you're looking at the corner of the square or, you know, one of the straight edges of the square until you actually went up and felt the damn thing, right? And maybe walked around it and took some measurements. Now, as such, as a second dimensional observer, if you were to encounter something of the third dimension, so I think the analogy they used in the book was like an apple. So like, let's say somehow an apple was to pass through flatland, right? To pass through that sheet of paper that has bound your existence and your understanding of reality for your whole life as a second dimensional observer. Um, you certainly wouldn't recognize it as an apple, right? So like as the apple begins to pass through flat land, you would see like a small little cross section of the bottom of it, like a line. 
And then as the apple got wider and started passing through it, you would see gradually um, wider and wider lines, which would eventually taper off down to the little line at the top of the core, the, the stem or whatever, right? Um, but as a second dimensional observer, witnessing an apple pass through flatland would be monumental. It would, it would be a mysterious, you wouldn't know how to measure for it because frankly, up and down have never come into your existence, only the vectors of left and right, right? You only exist on the X axis or whatever, right? Okay. So if you can kind of take that example of Carl Sagan's flatland analogy and apply it to our existence as three-dimensional observers, um, what would it look like if we were to encounter a higher dimensional object? And I guess for the record, um, in my opinion, the fourth dimension definitely involves time. And I think the, the easiest proof of that is um, an axiom. You cannot have two objects occupy the same space at the same time, right? You just can't. You can't have a ball at, at this space and another square or a cube at the same space at the same time. Two objects cannot occupy the same physical space at the same time. Uh, however, of course, two objects can definitely occupy the same space at different times. So we have another dimension in terms of time. Time is a fourth dimension that adds, uh, well, Basically, since we are bound to the third dimension, we are three-dimensional beings, um, when we experience time, um, we operate within it, and we can understand it, but we don't have any really, uh, we can't manipulate time. We are bound within time, and we are um, subject to the sways of time, but um, we can surf time, but we can't change the, um, change the current of time, if you will. And so that very much comports with the flatland analogy that uh, perhaps as we experience time, it is just a symptom or like a shadow of a higher dimension, right? And I think that is probably very appropriate. Now, when you get into even higher dimensions, fifth dimension and, and it, so on and so forth, um, hypothetically, they would be so far beyond our capacity to understand them it would be like, you know, a bacteria in your gut understanding calculus or the internet, right? It's just not going to happen. Um, and so, you know, with that in mind, um, when we're viewing the celestial luminaries, the mysteries of the Most High, um, those uh, experiences are so far beyond our capacity as little third dimensional observers to understand and to fathom and to operate uh, or to manipulate. Um, <laughs> all we can do is just observe them and witness shadows of them. Um, but in terms of, you know, traveling to these celestial luminaries and uh, digging up shovels full of them, it's, it's just never going to happen. Um, obviously, NASA has been lying about all that the whole time for decades, right? Um, so when we talk about the final experiment, the so-called final experiment, which is indeed just a far south observation, um, so it isn't an experiment at all, um, for anyone to say that if we have the circling sun in the far south, then the earth is obviously a globe, to me that's absurd, because in order to for the earth to be a globe, no, I'm good, thank you, in order for the... I'll get it in a minute. Um, in order for the Earth to be a globe, uh, it would have to have physical curvature, right? So if the Earth was a globe, as they claim, um, standing water, uh, any segment of a large body of water would be the arc of a sphere. And it would necessarily exhibit curvature. And frankly, when we measure for that curvature, it doesn't exist. Uh, the earth is definitely a plane. And so for someone, uh, anyone, to claim that they know what's going on in the heavens or uh, to claim that the heavens prove the earth being a sphere, um, it just, it falls short. And there's a lot of people saying things like high-profile flurfers are going to flip-flop to the globe 
you know, I just, I don't think that's necessarily going to happen, but I wouldn't stake my credibility on any far Southern observations, frankly, because I've never been to the far South. Um, if it turns out that the sun is circling during the Southern summer solstice in the far South, then what that proves to me is we need to go back to the drawing board in terms of understanding what the heavens are doing, which we've known that for years, right? At least I have, um, I think we need to prepare ourselves for the possibility that we as three-dimensional observers may never have the capacity to fully understand, comprehend, or, you know, dare I say, manipulate what's going on with the celestial luminaries, right? Um, and, I, and I think that the scripture says it best, not just... Uh, Judeo-Christian scripture, but all sorts of ancient uh, scripture. Uh, but they they say that the the heavens are the basically the mysterious handiwork of the Most High Creator of all things. Um, and I and I tend to agree with that. Um, we definitely experience the heavens from the physical ground. Um, only with our eyeballs, right? Maybe with the warmth of the sun or something like that. But we can only we can only observe the heavens. We can't go there. We can't, you know, like walk around that square and take measurements. Um, there is one instance when things that are occurring in the heavens can be physically measured by us wee little observers on the plane. And that is during, it's one time only, it's during uh, solar eclipses when the shadow of some celestial object, which may or may not be the moon casting that shadow, uh, is laid on the ground, and we can measure that shadow. And as I've said a million times, sometimes that shadow is two or three miles in diameter. Sometimes that shadow is 50 or 150 miles in diameter. It just depends on the solar eclipse. And... Um, you know, I just I just don't tend to think that the sun and the moon are physical objects. I don't. Like, maybe they're physical objects. Maybe they're spheres. Maybe they're disks. Um, but maybe they are something else entirely, something bound to a higher dimensional plane that we in the third dimension just are not capable of fully fathoming. Now, it certainly doesn't help that we've had NASA and the federal government lying to us, bald face lying to us for generations and teaching us lies since we were little kids that, oh, it's all three dimension and the third dimension just goes on to infinity, you know, in all directions and you've got spheres everywhere and one day we're going to cast our little cock rockets into space and, you know, go walk around and inhabit these other spheres like a virus, right? It's never going to happen. Um, there are no terra firma spheres in infinite space that you can go travel to and walk around on. Um, you know, I would say that we exist within the mind of the most high. And, you know, someone like Elon Musk would say that it's because we live in a computer simulation. Um, you know, maybe you could use that as an analogy, but I, I think that a computer simulation is closer to the truth than the third dimension going on forever infinitely, Right. That's just not what's happening. Um, the physical third dimension is um, is an illusion, right? So if we exist within the mind of the creator, the third dimension is merely an illusion. And we are bound within that dimension as third dimensional observers. We're, the only way we're going to transcend that is when we leave this place, when we pass on. Um, by the way, I lost a friend about 10 days ago, uh, my friend Gene of many years uh, passed away. I appreciate your guys' uh, prayers and comments. That was um, a difficult thing to go through. Um, just It was sudden. Uh, he had some, um, some blockages. Both of his um, carotid arteries had blockages. So I'm, honestly, I'm not even sure how he was walking around doing anything for a while. But um, it was sudden and... Uh, it throws you for a loop, man. It's, you know, you're up walking around, talking, joking around one day, and then um, then the next day you're just gone. Um, and it is, uh, it's sad, man. Where do we go? But, you know, anyway, my, my point on that was to say that um, 
I think the only way that we transcend the third dimension is maybe we get a glimpse of higher dimensions during dream state. And um, when we transcend this mortal coil, um, I, you know, I tend to uh, fall into line with the thinking of the so-called Gnostics, you know, the actual Christians, the, the people that walked in with and supped with Yeheshua, um, not Catholic priests, right? Far, far cry from Catholic priests, really. Um, but that is to say that, um, yeah, the physical world is an illusion. And, you know, it would be, it would be a miracle and a mystery that the physical came from intelligent mind, right? But it would be a miracle of miracles and mystery of mysteries if intelligence came from the third dimension, from the physical, right? So in, in that respect, I think that um, consciousness and the mind of God, the creator of all things, visible and invisible, is first. And the physical plane that we operate within is secondary. And this physical mortal coil is the illusion. And uh, really, I think that's mostly what Yeheshua was teaching about during his walk here. And uh, his message was um, snuffed out by the very people that murdered him, the Romans and the shoe hats. Um, And then they became the official vicars of Yeheshua on this mortal coil uh, with their golden chalices, purple robes, and diddling little boys, right? So anyway kind of got off into left field though, but I, I just wanted to get that out there because I had people posting comments in that last video that I made, like, so what you, so you don't think that the heavens are circling above? Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> obviously the heavens are circling above, but we experience the heavens from our personal subjective viewpoint, right? So like, you're never going to triangulate on a hologram, right? If that's what we're dealing with, basically. Um, you're never going to triangulate on a thought, right? So we experience the heavens subjectively from our little we ability to, as third dimensional beings, to just sort of see shadows or reflections of these higher dimensional objects, if they are even objects. But um, I think we're making a mistake when we try to ascribe physical laws to the celestial realm. Because frankly, I just don't see the celestial realm as physical as we think of it. Uh, maybe higher dimensional physically, but not uh, three dimensional physically. So there's that. Uh, post your questions, comments, and uh, I'm planning on doing some videos ab- about this where I can use graphics and uh, maybe explain it a little better and write out my little script. But I figured I would wing this and uh, just update you guys, let you know how everything's going, and um, we'll keep you posted. Love you guys very much. And I will see you in the next one. Y'all be good. Bye.